We all know that science is fundamentally based on empirical data. Observations and reproducible experiments with predictable results are crucial to the scientific method, and they are the foundation on which the entirety of modern science was built. So, what happens when our observations no longer align with the established theories? Now, usually this means one of a few things. The most simple possibility is that the observations were incorrect. Maybe somebody measured something incorrectly, recorded data using the wrong units of measurements, or even just forgot to carry the one. So Scientists are unfortunately humans too. These mistakes do happen sometimes, and it's one of the reasons that research is peer reviewed. It's better to have somebody else check your work and find any mistakes before making an ass of yourself by publishing a paper that incorrectly promises to change the understanding of the universe, and then it turns out you forgot to carry that one. Look, the next possibility is that the previously established theory is either wrong or incomplete. It's also something that happens with some regularity. Newton's law of gravity was great for a while, but future observations didn't align with the theory. I Einstein then refined our understanding of gravity with general relativity, which adequately explains the new observations while still predicting the same results that have been observed in previous experimentation. Then there's the third option. Sometimes when our observations don't match the predictions of the contemporary theories, people will just uh, make up any old sh to just force it to fit. One of the most famous examples of this was the geocentric model of the universe. It was decided that the Earth was the center of the universe because, of course it was. It made intuitive sense. The sun, the moon, the stars, and the planets all seemed to rotate through the night sky in these regular patterns. It definitely looked like everything was revolving around the Earth. And I mean, what was the alternative? Was everybody expected to believe that they were actually moving at 100,000 kilometers an hour, but they just couldn't feel it? Such an idea would have seemed ludicrous. But there was still one problem with everything orbiting the Earth, and that was retrograde motion. Usually, celestial bodies move across the night sky, but occasionally, planets seem to move backwards. While we now know this is because of our relative position in orbit around the Sun, this wasn't understood at the time. Instead, astronomers created the idea of epicycles. The resulting diagrams of our solar system looked like drawing from a spirograph, but it was easier to just make up a solution that fit the current model rather than to challenge those existing beliefs. So, what happens when observations of distant galaxies didn't match the predictions our current understanding of gravity provided? Well, gravity had already been found to be incomplete and in need of revision once, so the only logical solution to this problem was to declare that gravity was actually fine and that 85% of all matter in the universe must be completely invisible. The Origins of Dark Matter so the concept of dark matter actually goes all the way back to 1884, where it was first proposed by William Thomas, the famed British mathematician and physicist better known as the Right Honourable Lord Kelvin. He's the man whom the Kelvin Temperature Scale is named, though Thomas had received the title Lord Kelvin because his laboratory was near the River Kelvin. Of course, when Kelvin puts forth his proposal of dark bodies, it was more of just hypothetical speculation than anything else. He put forward this idea in a series of lectures, and it was based on some wildly incorrect assumptions. For for example, Kelvin assumed that the Sun was 20 to 100 million years old, missing the mark by, well, about 4.5 billion years. But again, this wasn't a formal theory. Kelvin was just throwing some ideas out there. In 1906, French polymath and scientist Henri Boyker expanded upon Kelvin's work. He referred to Kelvin's dark bodies as matière obscure, that's French for dark matter. From his calculations, he believed that the amount of dark matter would need to be less than the amount of visible matter, but his calculations were also based on Kelvin's calculations which were based on an assumption that was removed from reality by a factor of 45 to 200 or so. But these were still all loose, informal theories. The first person to present any real evidence for the existence of dark matter uh, would be Swiss astronomer Fritz Zwicky. Because of this, he's also credited with coining the term Dunkel Materie, or dark matter, despite it ever been used decades earlier by Poincar. In 1933, Zwicky was working at the California Institute of Technology to apply the viral theorem to a class cluster of over a thousand galaxies known as the Coma Cluster. The viral theorem relates to the average kinetic energy of a stable system, in this case the Coma Cluster, to its potential energy. Zwicky was able to estimate the mass of the system based on its brightness and the number of galaxies, but the observable mass could not account for the amount of kinetic energy. The outer galaxies were orbiting far too fast, and he determined that the cluster had to contain about 400 times as much dark matter as visible matter. This estimate was later shown to be extremely wrong, largely because he had used an incorrect 
correct value for the Hubble constant. Despite this minor mathematical blunder, the logic behind his theory seemed sound. The ratio of dark matter to visible matter would be greatly reduced, but it was believed that an invisible gravitational mass was the only solution for the observed behavior of the galaxies. Over the coming decades, more observations would be made that would support the idea of dark matter. Galaxies uh, were spinning in their outer regions faster than they should be able to, and some galaxies didn't even seem to contain enough mass to be held together by gravity. In the 1960s and 70s, American astronomers Vera Rubin and Kent Fort worked to measure the velocity curve of spiral galaxies with, with greater accuracy than ever using updated spectrograph technology. After their work was peer-reviewed, the pair published their highly influential paper, Rotational Properties of 21 SC Galaxies with a Large Range of Luminosities and Radii from NGC 4605 to UGC 2885. Catchy name. And that was published in the June 1980 issue of Astrophysical Journal. While we on this channel understand the desire for academics to publish papers with highly descriptive titles such as this, it may have appealed to a wider audience if they had uh, maybe titled it, Holy sh guys, dark matter's real, my dudes. But the results of their research seemed clear. All 21 galaxies that they had examined had flat velocity curves extending far from the galaxy centers. If the standard model of physics was correct, the only way this would be possible is if the average galaxy contained six times as much dark matter as it does visible matter. Numerous experiments and new forms of observation all strongly supported this conclusion. All the evidence created a strong argument that dark matter must exist. But that, of course, raised is another important question. What is dark matter? Thus far, we've only referred to dark matter as invisible matter, but what exactly is it? While the ability for regular matter to turn invisible could result in you living out either your wildest dreams or nightmares, it just is not possible. Throughout all of recorded history, there isn't a single verifiable instance of matter simply vanishing from sight. There are plenty of illusions and parlor tricks, but nothing real. That means dark matter needs to be something else entirely. Since dark matter is a hypothetical form of matter, it is believed to consist of a hypothetical particles that join the long list of particles scientists either believe or wish existed. Now, you're probably familiar with some other hypothetical particles, like the graviton, which is speculated to be responsible for the gravitational force, or the tachyon, a particle that moves faster than light and experiences time backwards. There are several different candidates for dark matter particles, with some of the most popular candidates featuring vaguely yet increasingly offensive names, such as Wimp, Simp, and Gimp. <laughs> These stand for weakly, strongly, and gravitationally interacting massive particles respectively, but there are plenty of other proposals such as sterile neutrinos and axions. Regardless of the slight variations, one of the two key characteristics of any dark matter particle is that it does not interact with the electromagnetic force. This means that it does not emit, absorb, or reflect light. This non-interaction with the electromagnetic force not only makes it undetectable on the visible spectrum, but by other methods such as radiation, microwaves, or really any method that you can think of to directly observe something. Hell, you can't even even hold it. And this is actually a bit counterintuitive at first. The first key characteristic of dark matter particles is that they're invisible to all forms of detection. But the second key attribute is that they are massive. Dark matter particles are believed to be 10, 100, or even a thousand times more massive than protons, which are the most massive subatomic particles we know exist. In fact, the entire point of hypothesizing dark matter in the first place is to account for the tremendous amount of mass that should exist in the universe. If it exists and has mass, then surely a giant wall of dark matter would stop you dead in your tracks like an invisible force field, right? And the answer to that is actually no, because of how matter works on the macroscopic level. Wood is a terrible conductor of electricity and cannot be magnetized, so if you were to grab a piece of wood off the ground, it's unlikely that you'll think this action was being made possible by the electromagnetic force. Essentially, the electrons in the atoms that make up you and the electrons in the atoms of a piece of wood repel one another since they are both charged negatively. This electromagnetic repulsion is what provides the tactile sensations that you feel, and it's why we're able to interact with other matter at all. Were this not the case, we would be able to just pass through solid objects, and that's exactly what happens with dark matter. Because dark matter particles don't interact with the electromagnetic force, we would theoretically be able to walk right through them without ever knowing they were there. In fact, some scientists believe that the Earth could frequently be crashing through giant walls of dark matter, there's just no way for us to detect it. So now that we have an understanding of what dark matter is, and why it was first theorized to exist, that just leaves us with a final question. Is dark matter actually real?
Well, we don't know yet, though evidence that supports its existence keeps piling up. Sure, it may rely on the existence of hypothetical particles, but that by itself doesn't mean it's just science fiction. After all, the Higgs boson was just a hypothetical particle until it wasn't. Definitively proving the existence of dark matter is quite a bit more difficult than finding the Higgs boson, which was already no simple task, but it still might be possible. However, there is one qualifier to this entire discussion and to all of the evidence in favor of dark matter. As we said before, dark matter appears to be the only explanation for our observations if the standard model of physics is correct. While the standard model works really, really well, that doesn't mean it's complete. Newtonian physics had also worked well before being supplanted by general relativity, so who is to say that that isn't going to happen again? It's already well accepted that our understanding of gravity is incomplete and that general relativity breaks down as the singularity inside a black hole, so it's quite possible that our current understanding of gravity may be far more incomplete than we realize. While the majority of astrophysicists are in agreement that dark matter must be real, there are alternative theories that attempt to explain our observations without the introduction of exotic matter. There are numerous different theories, but the most common approach is to attempt to modify general relativity. The most popular of these theories produce a new model of physics known as MOND, or Modified Newtonian Physics. The biggest issue with trying to create an alternate theory to dark matter is that evidence for dark matter has been observed through a wide variety of different approaches. Most theories are able to account for the observation using one or maybe even a few of these approaches, but few can account for all of the different observations that have been seen. But it's still not a foregone conclusion, as MOND has seen some amount of success in creating testable predictions. Of course, the greater scientific community is largely unimpressed. Since it's known that gravity is incomplete, it is absolutely possible that changes to general relativity could explain some of the evidence that has been observed. However, it is the prevailing opinion among astrophysicists that this would simply change the ratio of visible matter and dark matter. Instead of 6 to 1, it may only be 5 to 1, but it is generally believed that dark matter needs to exist in order for the universe to exist in the way that it does. Until such a time that an alternate theory is supported by more evidence than the theory surrounding dark matter, we're probably just going to have to take their word for it that it's a thing that's real. But on the bright side, at least scientists are focusing a lot of energy on something that can't actually hurt people for once. Unless, of course, macroscopic dark matter is real, in which case a single particle could tear through your body like a superheated bullet, which sounds fun. Thanks for watching. Thank you.